Uh, today, Sorry. we have a very, very special guest, Lance Miller. He's an award-winning public speaker, trainer. He has delivered over 5,000 speeches in over 60 countries uh, on leadership, overcoming failure and adversity. Lance is a member of the National Speakers Association, Rotary International, Toastmasters International. He is a distinguished Toastmaster, and in 2005, he emerged from a field of 40,000 contestants from 110 countries to win the title of Toastmasters, world champion of public speaking. Wow. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you, Genius Makers, Mr. Lance Miller. Thank you, Arash. Thank you very much, and thank you for everybody giving me some time today. Uh, I want to share with you some of the things I've learned through my path through life on leadership. And it was interesting, I was listening to your, I guess your, 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 your goals or your philosophies, I can't remember what you were saying when everybody was, uh, was starting there. I, this took me, this one philosophical point took me a long time to pick up, but it is sort of how I live my life today. And that is that good judgment comes from experience. And a lot of experience comes from bad judgment. Mm. And uh, I, for a long time in my life, up to, up to, to the mid to late 30s, I was beating myself up a lot individually because I didn't feel I was being as successful as I should be. And I was making mistakes and, and things didn't turn out like I wanted to. And I had a couple sort of moments of clarity. And I, I started looking at what I'd actually learned through the path I'd walked. And I realized I was missing a huge opportunity in life because I was not examining my regrets. I wasn't examining my failures for the lesson that was in them. And Part of that was in my path to the world championship, I lost speech contests. I lost that competition for 12 years. It was the 13th year I was competing, but I finally was able to make it to the final stage. It goes up six levels over six months, three different speeches and things. And I, I was so frustrated. And one of the things I learned how to do through speech competitions was learning how to lose. And from a leadership standpoint, I really think this viewpoint has been something that's really helped me because you're going to make, in any leadership role, you're going to make bad decisions. You're going to have bad judgment. And the important thing is, is to take that bad judgment and turn into experience so you have good judgment the next time you're, you're confronted with that situation. I was sharing with Arash earlier that uh, when I, I started to get asked to come out to speak, I really made a pact with myself that I would not go out and talk about things that I hadn't experienced or I, I didn't know worked because I've seen a lot of people in the speaking industry and in life in general that they'll go do a course on something and then they'll come teach you what they learned in the course. And they never went out in life and tried it. So what I'm gonna do today is, is share with you some of the experiences I've had in learning the critical, critical principles in leadership that I rely on every single day of my life when I'm working and what keeps me stable in organizations, which I go into organizations now and basically build teams and figure out why they're not working and uh, get them actually winning as an organization. I like seeing everybody, but I do have, I, I have some graphics I wanna describe. So I'm gonna flip over and pull up a PowerPoint and uh, so we can walk through this. And the other thing is I have about three hours of material. Now what, that, that looked like it pulled it up on the wrong screen for me. Let me pull that out again. Should be that one. Let's see. There we go. So you see the slide, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. I have probably about three hours of material I'm going to try to compact down into this hour we have. And my, I looked at, I could take one or two principles and really go deep, deep on them. I think it's better to cover a broad scale of things. And then if... At some point in the future, we want to revisit something or do something, we can drill down on some of the different components. The, my viewpoint on leadership is really is this. It, it is everybody's business. And that comes from working from a lot of organizations where they sort of had the old British Navy attitude where the officers and the seamen were, were in two different areas. And the officers were leading the, the ship and the seamen were down in the belly. And nobody, the seamen didn't know what, what was going on. 
the best organizations I've been a part of and the best organizations I've led, we got everybody on the same team trying to achieve the same activities. And, and it, we really realized that I did through the course of that, that leadership really is everybody's business and everybody needs to know what's happening. And so let me go through a little bit of my history so you can sort of understand where I come from. Uh, I grew up in a rural area of Indiana. My family had a milk and ice cream business. My grandfather had started that in 1924 and my father was in it and then I came in it. So I grew up driving milk trucks. <laughs> I grew up being a milkman. I said I was a teenage milkman. And uh, this is a picture of my <laughs> sister and I dipping ice cream at a local, uh, local <laughs> fair and stuff. But I really learned how to work. I, I started working when I was about 10 years old. And by the time I was 12, I was running crews and I was having to unload trucks and I was having to start figuring out how to get teams to work together. Moved on, I moved to California in 84 and I worked with the Olympic Committee. I was actually an executive with them. Oh, That's Mary Lou Retton, if, if you don't recognize her, who was the uh, gold medal gymnast. And yes, that's how tall she is. And that's back when I had a full head of hair. <laughs> the Olympic experience for me was absolutely phenomenal. You talk about building everybody on the same team. I, I came into the Olympic headquarters when there were about 4,000 people working there. And it was most one of the most exhilarating, exciting things I've ever done in my life. I would have worked for the Olympics for the rest of my life. I've never been so excited and happy to work with, with a group of people. It was just a phenomenal, life-changing experience. I did not experience that in most of my corporate environment. So, and that was one of the things I had this, I'd left my family business, came to California, was an executive with the Olympics, had a, just an incredible experience. And then I spent two years with Nestle and brand management. I did two product launches with them. I worked on four different brands. And one of the things I learned working for Nestle is I don't do well in a cubicle. <laughs> That's not an indigenous area for me. But I did learn a lot of very valuable organizational experience in there. I spent two years with Anheuser-Busch in sports marketing, and I got to basically run some of the largest sporting events in Southern California as I did that and had a lot of fun, drank a lot of beer, but I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I moved out from there, and over the last 25, 30 years, I've had been involved in five new business startups. I was not the founder. I was one of the... Um, basic ma management people that came in to actually get it off the ground. I've done probably six turnarounds. And I, I'm going to tell you this, I did not do corporate turnarounds because I was looking to go do a corporate turnaround. I did have a couple that, that were that way. Usually I went to work for a company and the economy shifted or the technology shifted. And we had to figure out what to do to keep the company alive. And in the process of that, I started to de develop different skill sets on not being really fixated on this is how it has to be. And I've got some great stories that would fill the hour of being in one business and morphing something over to another. Also, I've had probably seven failed starts and turnarounds. It didn't, did, the companies didn't start, they didn't turn around. And those are some of the ones I learned the most from on why they didn't actually take off. And just so you know, I'd usually be working one job and working a couple of these turnarounds in the evening, startups in the evening, trying to get things moving. I've also been, excuse me, a senior um, C-level executive in two international nonprofit foundations. Um, so I've worked a lot in the nonprofit sector as well. And that's a really interesting area to work in as far as leadership goes. I was a pilot at 19. I sailed across the Atlantic from the Virgin Islands to Norway at 20. Uh, I want to, this, this was a critical component in my leadership development. I've scuba dived all over the world, including under frozen lakes in the dead of winter. And I've rafted and canoed almost all the roughest white water in the US. I was very successful in my adventure organizations. When I was going back in the corporate world, I wasn't as successful back in my 20s and stuff. Um, it, about 25 years ago, I was recruited to lead a team of 10 runners from around the world on a 2000 mile marathon through eight countries over six weeks, basically, protesting and bringing to the surface specific human rights violations and religious freedom violations that were taking place in those countries. And this is where my adventure experience and my corporate experience started to come together. And I really started to see what some of the leadership components were made of. 
Today, I have a company called Miller, Knudsen & DeRay, and we basically are a fractional, a fractional management team. We go into businesses and we help structure the business. We run parts of the business until it's actually functioning properly. And the whole component that we try to do is get everybody on the same page and work as a team. Now, I'm big on definitions. And a team, my definition of a team is a group, and it doesn't matter if it's hamsters, horses, or humans to me, it's a group pulling in the same direction. And I got to break horses and we raised horses when I was back in Indiana as a kid. And it was easy to hook one pony up to a pony cart and have them pull the cart. It was hard to get two to pull together. And that's when you have a, a team of animals, they're pulling together. If you have a team of people, everybody's pulling in the same direction. And so that's really, what we're able to do is to get teams working together. Now let's take a look at uh, leadership. I hear a lot out in the, the world, I get to go to a lot of seminars and a lot of trainings, and there's this whole thing called servant leadership now that's this big buzzword. In the Toastmasters organization, we talk about servant leadership all the time. I don't think there's any other type of leadership, correct leadership. I don't think that, to me, servant leadership is leadership. You know, and you know, it, it's interesting. You have a, um, there's, there's different viewpoints you have. I'm trying to remember, I was thinking right before the, before the speech there, I said there was the British form of leadership in the British uh, uh, Navy where the officers were one area, the seamen were another area, and it created dissension between the two. The Marine Corps has a motto for leadership and their motto is officers eat last. And what that means is as a leader, you make sure your people are taken care of before you start taking any comfort yourself. You take care of your people first. And I was never in the military myself, but I've worked with a lot of people in the military. And that really, to me, sums up what the essence of leadership is. The, the leaders eat last. You make sure your people are good. And here's the thing. Being a, leadership is not about creating people you can control. And I've seen this over and over in organizations where it's like the whoever the supervisor, manager is in the area, they were trying to control exactly what everybody's doing and they wanna know where you are and what's going on. And that's not the game. The game is creating people you don't have to control and creating people that know, that's why I say leadership is everybody's responsibility. And when everybody assumes that leadership role, they're all on the same team, they're all pulling together and you don't have to control people because you know what you're doing. Okay. So pulling this down, the next, next point is here. I love, uh, when we were kids, I think you'd all agree, we had a lot of free will, <laughs> you know? And if you remember when Saturdays lasted all day, right? It was like, it was Saturday, this is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I could be happy playing with a box and a yardstick for like the whole afternoon. And what happens though, as we grow up, the adults, the authorities in our life tell us to sit there and be quiet, you know, if, Parents tell us to be quiet when we have to behave, what's acceptable, not be acceptable. We go to school, we're told what seat to sit in at what time. And as long as we follow the rules, we get to progress through the grades and graduate from school. We come to work, we're told where to sit. Not every place, but hopefully not, not in, in, your, in your environment. But I, I've had a lot of areas where you're told what to sit, what to do, don't rock the boat. If we like you at some point, we'll promote you. And it seems like our free will got cut off by the authorities in our life and we become hypnotized by authorities. A lot of people I've seen in leadership try to lead by strictly an authoritative viewpoint. And I was talking about servant leadership earlier. The other types of leadership for me are oppressive leadership <laughs> where it's like, I am your leader, you will do what I say and I will control you. And I've been in those environments and it's sort of like get on the treadmill and run harder and I had no idea what we're doing, but all the person's trying to do is control the area and oppress everybody through an oppressive leadership. For me, leadership is servant leadership, and we just call the other stuff oppressive leadership. But what I've seen with a lot of people is that they've had bad experiences with authority, or they have gotten sort of in this hypnotic frame where they're looking for people, they're, they're looking for lead, the manager, the leader in the organization to tell them what to do all the time, and they stop thinking for themselves. So the whole thing I work on as a leader is reigniting that free will in the individual, seeing the twinkle in their eye, seeing the spring in the step, getting them to own their position that they're in so that I have someone I don't have to control. 
there anymore. And as I roll along here, there's three types of people that I look at in an organization as a leader. The first type of the per first type of person, get over there, there we go, is the person you can't control. And this is the person you say, you need to be here at eight o'clock. You know, this is what I need you to do. They don't show up at eight o'clock. They take long lunch breaks. You know, they're on their Facebook or their cell phone all the time. They're not, they're not doing the job they need to do. And no matter how much you work with them, they're, you can't seem to get them on the page where they're working. In most of the organizations, I have to basically, which I'm going to get into in a second, basically move them off the line because I can't control them. We have to have someone who's willing to pull in the same direction. The second type of person that I look at is someone I can control. If I tell them to do a job, they'll sit down and do the job. If I say, I need you here at nine in the morning, they're here at nine in the morning, you know, and they know when the breaks are. They're not on their cell phone all the time. They're doing their job and I can control them. The third type of person is the person I don't need to control. And they know what their job is. They show up on time uh, on that. The first type, number one, they do nothing but cause problems. Person number two doesn't cause a lot of problems, but at the same token, they're not solving problems. Person number three is not causing problems, but they are solving problems before they get handled. So, or before the problem manifests. And this is the type of person that's willing to take full responsibility for a client, or they understand there's a problem with a server in the IT area, and they realize that's gonna be a problem if we don't fix it, they're not letting it break. They actually are taking the initiative that they own the area they're working in, and they don't have to be controlled or told what to do. They're actually on the team working with it. So the whole area I'm working in is trying to get people up to a point where they don't have to be controlled. The, the other component that I look at a lot is the emotional, the emotional component of the group. Now, there's a whole deep dive I can do into emotional intelligence, but I'm just gonna say this. We have negative emotions and we have positive emotions. And in a group, there are negative and positive emotions. I'm very sensitive to negative emotions in a group. And your negative emotions are things like antagonism is a negative emotion. Hate is a negative emotion. Anger is a negative emotion. Fear is a negative emotion. If you have someone who's operating in fear because they have an authoritative leader over them and they're afraid to make a, they're afraid to make a mistake, that breeds a negative emotion and it breeds discontent in the organization. I watch the morale of the group very high. And my whole, my, one of my main things I focus on is keeping the morale of the group high. High emotions are enthusiasm, cheerfulness, interest. Happiness isn't really emotion. I can talk about that all day. It's a condition. And so, uh, and what makes people enthusiastic and cheerful and excited about doing their job is accomplishment. Having parties does not raise, does not make people feel great. What makes people feel great is actually accomplishing things. And so as a leader, I'm, I'm looking at how can I get this group winning at what they're doing? Okay, this is a, oh man, the meaning of life is that, I hate it when this happens on these PowerPoint, I mean, these Zoom calls, that gets cut off. Um, this is a slide I use in my, my live presentations, which I have a lot of fun with. And I'd like to have one that says, the meaning of leadership is that you have to, <laughs> the solution is you have to figure it out for yourself. Here's the simplicity with, with, that I learned about leadership. If I run into a problem and I don't know what to do and I go, well, I'm going to go ask so-and-so what I should do or I'm going to wait for someone to come tell me what to do and I don't take the initiative to figure that problem out for myself and come up with solutions and start thinking on my own. And this is part of that free will creativity component I was talking about. I have to be able to create, think, come up with solutions. If I'm waiting for someone else to come tell me what to do, they are the leader, not me. If I want to be the leader, I need to come up with solutions. Now, that doesn't mean I'm a loose cannon, just coming up with things that's not coordinated. I might have to coordinate with a lot of the different superiors in my organization, but let me come up with solutions so that I can be that person you don't have to control. I'm already working to come up with, trying to solve the problem, come up with what's going to work from that standpoint. So this, this component, and this is what I see going through families, schools, a lot of organizations, people are told what to do so much, they don't think that they can come up with a solution and that there's somebody else that's smarter than them that's gonna give them the solution. So quite often I've created scenarios where I put my teams in 
situations and told them to figure it out because I wanted them to start figuring things out for themselves. Okay, so figure it out for yourself. Now, let's read a great book on lead leadership years ago. It's called The Dictionary. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. <laughs> There's all this information on, on about leaders or visionaries and uh, they're inspirational and stuff. And I go, I can never take those things and go, how do I take a hammer and hit the nail on the head being visionary? Now, I'm going to tell you what visionary means in a meeting in a minute, but there was a time on planet Earth where the word lead did not exist. And there were a bunch of people sitting around a campfire, you know, roasting pig or something, and they, they, they had had a grunt. And they, would, they would grunt something, and they go, you know, when we do that, we need to come up with a word that means that. So they go, good, let's call that thing lead. Now, what does lead mean? Well, it comes from a Latin word, or excuse me, an old English word, laden. And what it means, it means to go someplace. If you're leading, you're going someplace, you're traveling, you're moving. And this is where I get into oppressive leadership. Oh, yeah, my photo up there. There we go. So you're moving someplace. This is where my adventure activity played so well into my leadership skills, because whenever I was doing an adventure program, I was flying someplace. I knew where I was going. When I was sailing, we knew where we were going. When I was doing a rafting trip, we knew where we were putting in. We knew how many days we'd be on the river. We're coming out. We have to coordinate. I always knew where I was going. But when I got into business situations, many businesses I worked in, it was just get on the treadmill and run harder. And I never felt like I was going anywhere. The thing I loved about working with the Olympics is that we were going someplace towards a, a successful Olympic Games. The reason I love doing startups is we're going someplace to get this business off the ground and we're trying to get certain level of activity going on. So I realized the first component of leadership, here we go, is knowing where you're going. And this can't be understated. And there's a number of reasons for this is that if you're leading a group of people and you're trying to get them to accomplish something and they don't necessarily, they're not accomplishment, it turns into a battle between your will and your intention and their will and their intention. And it sort of turns into this situation. You're trying to push them harder to accomplish something. But if you all know where you're going, you agree on where you're going. So you're all pushing towards the goal. And it doesn't turn into a confrontational aspect with you as a leader because the second component of leadership is arriving there. Now, quite honestly, I could end this talk right now. If you know where you're going and you can get your team to arrive there, you're a leader. If you know where you're going and you can't get your team to arrive there, you're not a very good leader because you're not achieving your objective. And if you don't know where you're going, there's no way you can lead. And so a critical component of leadership is having specific targets and goals and accomplishments that we're going to want to achieve. And I'm going to get into this in greater detail on, on how to put a structure together around so you have you have some tools to lead with. These two points, know where you're going and arriving there, are where I'm focused all the time when I'm working with a group. And I'm there's all sorts of things that blow up. There's all sorts of things that happen in the businesses or the nonprofits or the adventure activities or my, you know, my for seven years I led running teams on over 17 countries, over 17,000 miles. Of, um, of marathons and there were all sorts of crazy things that happened, but we always had our objective in every day where we were going and we had to hit that objective. And that really taught me in the businesses I go into now, no matter how much confusion is blowing up, I've got to keep that target in my mind and make sure I'm moving everybody towards it and helping my team achieve that. Okay, now, how do you do that? How do you know where you're going and how do you get people to arrive there? Well, there's two things that I use in leadership. I'm not a very complicated guy. Two things that are the two tools I use in leadership. The first one is communication. And I'm gonna get into this, into my communication, but you cannot lead a group of people if you're not all able to talk to each other, okay? The second one is agreement. So I'm working with two things. I'm working on communicating with my teams and I'm working on building the agreement. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be looking at areas where I have disagreement and turning that into agreement. And as I build more and more agreement, we have less disagreement and we're able to start achieving the objective of where we're going. I'm gonna drill down on communication for just a second. 
first of all, I have a law <laughs> and it's the amount of communication necessary to lead an organization is grossly underestimated. And I mean, in a lot of places I've worked, 5% of the necessary communication was being given to the subordinates in the organization. So we knew what was going on. People were making decisions and closed door rooms or up on the 15th floor or something. And then all of a sudden some policy would come out and we didn't really know where we were going or what was, what was happening. Now, this Sunday is the Super Bowl. And I love sports as a team building activity because it's a great level playing field. Everybody's buddies playing by the same rules. Let's just look at the uh, a football team. Now this is the Broncos. I think when I put this slide together, the Broncos were in the Super Bowl. but how much communication goes on during a football game? After every play, they huddle and they put their plan together on what they're going to do on the next play. You have defensive coaches, you have uh, offensive coaches, offensive coordinators, you got a head coach, you got guys up in the booth that are looking down and they're analyzing what's going on. They're all communicating, trying to figure out what play is going to work, what's the defense doing. And this communication is running back and forth. For the last two weeks, both teams have been looking at game films and working out how they are going to actually play the game. And there's a thing I call in, in my organizational aspects, what's your practice to execution ratio? And most of us in business practice maybe an hour a month. <laughs> we sort of get up and wing it every day. But a professional uh, football team practices typically five days for every day they play football. It's five to one practice to execution. Okay, so you have a lot of communication taking place. So as a leader, I'm always looking at making sure I'm in good communication with my group. Now, here's the other one is this is an area of leadership that I have learned the lesson on so many times where I didn't listen. Okay, now when I do these live, I do a certain thing with this, but I'm going to show you this is an interesting word. Okay, same words of listen is silent. And you need to be listening to your people. And there's two reasons you want to listen to the people that you're leading. Okay. I say it's more important than speaking because it creates importance. When you listen to people, it makes that person important to you, to, to, for them. They know that you're willing to listen to them. In my family's business, we had some significant labor problems that came out of the business. And that when it came and boiled down to it, what it was is my father did not like listening. He didn't like people coming into his office. He felt that he was pretty good at it, but he, he, the communication was way out between him as the leader of the organization and the rest of the organization, and people didn't feel that he cared about them. And we actually were able to get the communication back in, and then they actually realized he really did care about them. He had just an odd way of caring about them. But, but listening to people, and if you think about any time you've been in a situation where someone didn't want to hear from you, it made you feel less in some capacity. It did not endear you to that individual or to the organization. And you can create a lot of dissension in an organization by not listening to people. Now, another leadership rule. Here's the other reason as a leader, you want to have an ear and know what people are thinking and have them come to you first. And that is this. If they're not talking to you, they're talking to somebody else. And I got to tell you, I've seen this happen over and over again. If somebody has a disagreement or they're disgruntled in some component and they can't get to you as a leader, they will start talking to their fellow coworkers and they'll start breeding and spreading that discontent in your group and it starts to destroy the team. I'm a huge fan and follower of a gentleman named Ernest Shackleton. And I don't know if you know who Ernest Shackleton was, but he was almost the man who got he came, uh, the South Pole in 1911. He came with 100 miles and he realized he wouldn't have enough food. So he turned around and came out. And then two years later, Amundsen got the South Pole as in the age of discovery. So Shackleton goes back to Antarctica in 1914 with 28 men to be the first man to cross Antarctica by land. And his ship gets stuck in the ice and then crushed. And he moves out on the ice with 28 men. And it's the most incredible story <laughs> I've ever uh, read on survival. He saves all 28 men. It was the middle of World War I. Nobody was there to save him with three lifeboats in the Arctic Ocean. And one of the things Shackleton did, he was, the, one of the keys that I, re I learned reading his books is that 
he was keen on the morale of his men. And so when they were camping on the ice, he put all of the troublemakers in his tent. He put all of the people that were discontented and would, would breed ill, ill will with, with his men in his tent so he could listen to them. They would talk to him. He didn't want them talking to the men and bringing the emotional uh, negative tone of the whole group down because he knew the only way you survive in the Arctic is having a high morale team. Okay, so the point is, if you're not listening as a leader, your people are going to be talking to someone else. It behooves you to have an open door and to listen to people. And quite honestly, when I talk about the amount of communication necessary is grossly underestimated. A lot of that is personal one-on-one -on -one community, you know, one-on-one -on -one communication with someone. It's like calling somebody in your office you know, twice a month and just saying, hey, I just want to know how's it going down there? What's happening? How are you feeling? Do you have any problems? How's, how are things at home? Tell me what's going on with you. Okay. And the person knows that as a leader, you care about them. You take them out to lunch once in a while, or you sit down in a little huddle of three or four people and you just say, what are you running into? Tell me what's going on. Is there anything that, that I'm not aware of that you need help with? And the fact that they know you're open to that endears them to you because they know that they are important to you and you want them to win with it. Okay, moving on on communication. This is the other thing I was going, it's not what you say, it's what got understood. <laughs> and by definition, communication is not what leaves the person speaking, it is what arrives at the person hearing. It's what, it is what gets duplicated. And the reason I say this is that there's a lot of things as a leader that communicate. How you walk through the office communicates. Whether your door is open or not communicates. How you dress communicates. If you leave early, that communicates something. How you treat somebody else, that communicates something. If you come in the office every day and you say hi to one person and don't say hi to another person, that communicates something. Okay, and there's a ratio of importance in people that I've, I've observed in life. And that is the less important the individual the more importance needs to be granted to that individual. And so when you have someone who's working as, let's say, a clerk, potentially a receptionist, not to discount any of those people, because they're all important roles, as a leader in an organization, it's important for me to say hi to them, to say good morning to them, to check on them, because it's very easy that they can feel like they got snubbed some way, and then it starts to build that ill content and starts to breed the negative emotion into the organization that you don't want to breed into the organization. So the other thing is, there's a lot of times I've worked with executives, I've been on teams with other executives, and they think they stand up and they said, we're doing great, we have it to work a little harder to get something done, but I'm really proud of everybody. But what got communicated was, your mother don't work here, and if you don't get your butt in gear and make this happen, I'm going to fire everybody. That's actually what got duplicated. They didn't think they said that, but that's what the team heard. So one of the things I said on the communication is understand it's not what you say, it's what gets understood. So that's where the listening skills are very, very important. We're going to jump into agreement now. I have five basic points of agreement that I put in to an organization as a leader to build the team and get everybody on the same page. I want to give you a definition of agreement. First, as I said, I'm, I'm big on opening up the dictionary and getting my own definitions of words so I can understand it. We can say agreement. What's that really mean? For me, it means cooperation without conflict. So agreement means we're all cooperating. We don't have conflict going on. So what that means is if we have conflict, we don't have agreement. Now, in the beginning of this talk, I was saying we're building agreement and what I'm constantly doing is find disagreement or conflict and turning it into agreement. We're going to look at how to do that from a leadership standpoint. As I was working with um, Anheuser-Busch, I, I wasn't in the pits, but I got to be right behind the pits in a number of auto races. And I would watch an IndyCar team or a Formula One team go out and change four tires, fill the car with fuel, adjust the wings on the car, and then give the driver a drink of water in eight seconds. Now, that takes total agreement to do that. I grew up in Indiana. The Indy 500 is one of the biggest things that happens in the state. And as a kid, I got to go out to that four or five times. I usually watch it each year. The winning margin in the Indy 500 is less than two seconds. 
The difference between first and second place, 500 miles, two and a half hours is less than two seconds. One of these guys goes to the wrong tire. The guy trying to give the driver the water gets in the way of the guy trying to put the fuel in the car can lose the game for the whole team. If they're not in agreement, if there's conflict, it's going to lose, cause that to be a, a loss for the team because two seconds, two extra seconds in the pits, that could be all it takes to lose that race for someone who's actually got everything going for them. Now, when I look at organizations, I'm looking for the conflict because I know the same thing's happening in my organization. It's causing us to take longer to get things done. It's causing emotional tension in areas where I have conflict and it's working to get everybody on the same page. So I'm looking for, I'm, I'm wanting to see where we're cooperating and I'm wanting to see where do I have the conflict and then I'm gonna take that conflict and we're gonna figure out how to actually get the agreement on it. Now, when you have conflict, there's two choices you have. And this is a critical thing as a leader. One of the worst things you can do is allow a conflict to continue and not, not handle it. So you have two ways of handling a conflict. The first way is you resolve the conflict. Okay. And that's basically everybody stays where they are. You work out some way to resolve this so it's not a conflict anymore. If the conflict won't resolve, and this normally comes down to personnel issues, but it could come down to the facility you're in. If you have a conflict in the way the facility works, you might have to take the second one, which if you don't resolve it, you have to dissolve it. So I've got a real simple approach on that. We're going to resolve this or we're going to dissolve it. If I have personnel problems, I basically am having a talk with my people and saying, we're either going to resolve this, we're working together in agreement, or we're going to dissolve it. And that means one or both of you are going to be working someplace else that uh, we don't have the conflict anymore. And I've got a lot of stories. Uh, if, if I had three hours, I could, I could tell you stories I've had with very, the types of people you can't control creating conflict in an organization. And we basically tried to resolve it, tried to resolve it, tried to resolve it, wouldn't resolve, good, we're going to dissolve it. Once we, did, we, we dissolve it, we handle the conflict. But as a leader, one of the worst things you can do is allow conflicts to continue on and on and on, because just like not listening to people, if you allow conflicts to continue, the people down in the trenches start to feel that you as a leader don't care about them because you're making it difficult for them to do their work. If you're down resolving conflicts, you're going, wow, this guy's really on top of everything. They'll follow you any place. And I've, had, I've, I've experienced both. I've had situations where I didn't handle conflicts and I had dissension happen between me and my group. And I've had other situations where I was right on top of stuff. And I would have people take a bullet for me um, after a while because they were so happy to be working with me because they knew that I cared about them and I had their back. Okay, there's five points of agreement I look to create in an organization. And once well, I'm gonna walk through this, I'm also gonna use as a sort of a template analogy is my trip to Norway to, to, to use how I, we applied this in that sailing trip that summer. But a couple points on this as I'm going through it, we'll wrap this up in the end. Once you get these established, it allows you to see exactly where the conflict or the disagreement is. So you're focusing on which step of these five points you need to get more agreement on. So this is a great way to get the organization put in so you have the infrastructure to be able to lead. And at the same token, if you have conflict, you can identify where the conflict is so you're not addressing the wrong area. Okay, so the, the first point is, as we talked about, leading is knowing where you're going. Where are we going? Do we have a clear definition of where we're going? In an organization, do you have a clear definition of where you're going? Now that could be a year end goal, it could be a quarterly goal, it could be we're gonna build this thing up and in three years sell it, that's what the goal is, but do we know where we're going? In 1999, I did an internet startup and we had a very clear goal. The founder put the company together and he wanted to build a company and sell it for $100 million. And at that point, that was, a lot of companies were doing that. We had a very clear target on what we needed to do, where we were going, was we had to have so many subscribers to our site and the valuation, we knew exactly how the valuation was going to be made. So we knew where we were going. And so for that year and a half, I was doing that startup. That's what we were focused on was actually where we're going all the time. Like I said, these are the goals, the objectives, the end game. Okay. Now, when I was, this is my trip to Norway here. So I'm down here in the Virgin Islands and we knew where we were going, which is up here in the right-hand corner. We knew we were going to Norway. 
Now we had 12 people on the boat. If one person wanted to go to Miami, somebody else wanted to go to Halifax, Nova Scotia, somebody else wanted to go to the Canary Islands, it's gonna create a huge problem because we're not all going to the same place. And so you're trying to go one direction and people wanting to go another direction. Key component, the first thing to nail down as a leader is where are you going? The next area is why are you going there? Now, Simon Sinek put a great book together called Start With Why. Why is so important because this is the purpose part of what you're doing. And human beings, we're not computers. We don't run on analytics as much as we run on emotion. And emotion is fueled by purpose. And again, this is another deep dive we could do on purpose. But you have the purpose for the trip, but every individual in your organization has a purpose. And as a leader, you need to understand the purposes of the people in your group and what they want to accomplish, but you also need to build that purpose into the team purpose on why you're going to accomplish, accomplish the goal. And the purposes change over time too. And you'll, you'll, I've seen that happen quite a bit. Quite honestly, it's like I, I was almost 30 years ago, I went into a law firm as the client procurement officer. It was a lemon, they did lemon law, which is Song Beverly Consumer Auto Warranty Act. And my initial purpose for taking that job was I needed a job. And I'd never worked in law, I didn't know anything about it. But then I set up the marketing on it and I was interviewing people every day who had these horrible car problems and the dealer wasn't taking care of them and it was financially killing them and it was, they couldn't get to work and it was a horrible thing. And the purpose for me being there was to help all the people who called me. And I was like, I, I felt like I was Dr. Phil or something. <laughs> I had my headset on and all I'm doing is handling car problems all day. And if we couldn't handle them, I figured out how to direct them to people that could or give them a good assessment of what their situation was. That was so fulfilling, the purpose of helping those people. But that purpose shifted over time. So the second area of um, agreement you need to get is the purpose on why you're wanting to accomplish this. The third is the how. How are you going to do this? And this is the organization, the planning. This is a huge step, usually, in getting agreement on it. When we were sailing, where were we? Come on. We were sailing. The how we were going to go there, we knew we were going to go to Bermuda. Then we were going to go to the Azores. Then we were going to go to Southern Ireland. Then we were going to drag the boat directly through Ireland. Actually, we go around through the Irish Sea. But um, <laughs> then we we're going to go across the Caledonia Canal. Uh, across the North Sea to Stavanger, Norway. We knew how we were going to get there. We knew how much food we needed. We knew the timelines we were going, going on. So we all agreed on how we were going to do this. Okay. So except in, in um, an organization aspect, this is the planning, the strategic and tactical planning, which are two different things you got to work on. The administration of it, the policy, the resources you're going to need. Okay. It's a big step on how you're going to get there but it's an area you have to have agreement on. The next area is who is doing what? What roles do different people have? And do people know what their role is and they know what the other people's roles is? Because what happens in so many organizations that I go into today is people are doing each other's jobs and we haven't clarified exactly what position somebody's in, okay? It's an area of conflict that comes up quite often. Again, in the sailing environment, we knew who was raising the sails when we were moving. We knew who was at the helm. We knew who was in the galley. Every ninth day you're in the galley or the galley slave. When you're in the galley, you don't go out and handle the sails. You're making food for everybody that day. We knew what position you were in and we rotated through those positions and uh, did that, kept that very, very stable from that standpoint. And the last point is what metrics are you measuring? Now, remember, we're going someplace. So we need to put into the organization hard metrics on how we're progressing. When I was doing the internet startup, we had how many people had subscribed to our site as a hard metric. Okay. In my sailing stuff, which is my next slide here, we had a compass heading, we had boat speed, we had miles traveled every day, longitude and latitude, barometric pressure. We were monitoring radio frequencies to figure out our location. We had hard metrics that we knew where we were on the surface of the earth. And here's why you need hard metrics. First of all, everybody knows the need what everybody needs to know what the score is with what the game is. And the other thing is if here we go, if you're not managing by metrics or if you are managing, you're managing by facts. 
And there's an old saying that says facts are stubborn things. But if you're not managing by fact, you're managing by opinion. And opinions are like armpits. Everybody's got a couple, but nobody wants to experience the other person's, okay? Now, the simplicity of it is a lot of businesses I've been in were managed by opinion. And it was irregardless of the facts of what were going on. People were kept on positions based on opinion. Clients were given special prices based on opinion. When I was learning to fly, I learned to trust my instruments because if you flew based on what was called the seat of your pants, you would die. So I had to learn to run the facts of my instrument panel and the facts of my horizon and the facts of the weather that I was working with and the facts of my altitude and the facts of my fuel burns. I had to learn to work with those facts because if I just flew on opinion, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. Okay, so the, the metrics serve two purposes. It keeps everybody on the team knowing what the score is and knowing how they're approaching their target, their goal. And it keeps the leader or the other team members from exerting opinion into the decision-making process. Okay, last thing I wanna cover with you and then we hopefully have time for a couple of questions if you want it. I call this the four Ps of leadership. Now we were talking, we just got through talking about having hard metrics you're measuring so you know where you are. Okay, now the responsibility of a leader is to get the area into production. That means producing the products and accomplishing the, the, the goals and purposes of the organization. Before you can get something into production, senior to that actually, is you have to have the planning in to get the production in. Above planning is you have to have prediction in the environment to be able to plan properly. Okay? And this, this goes across adventure activities, this goes across building a house, a political campaign, I don't care. You have to be able to predict your environment accurately to put the plan together. And once you get the plan together, you get your production in. The above prediction is perception. You have to see the environment. You have to know what's going on in the environment. If you're blind, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to make good decisions to predict, plan, and then get the production going. So this is another area, just like those five points of agreement I have, when things bog down and I'm having problems, I start to go, let's get the facts on what's going on. Let's look at what's happening. People are coming up and telling me what the problem is. And I'm getting, that's an opinion, that's an opinion, that's an opinion. Let's go look. Now, I'll just give you an example. Three years ago, I launched an online summit training program. And I, I did a whole interview, or 33 interviews with 33 world champion speakers. And we went into their whole life story and how they competed and their speech and all the things that have happened since then as, a, as an example of all the world champion speakers from Toastmasters. So I launched it and my website was taking 45 seconds to load. So I'm not getting production happening on the website. We have a plan. We have no prediction now on what's gonna happen. And I'm talking to my IT partner and I said, why is it taking so long? He goes, I don't know. He goes, I can't see what's going on because we were on a shared server. So he goes, I think it's this, I can try this. Maybe we'll do this. I'm gonna try this if it works. I said, no, we don't have perception on the website. We need to go find why it's not loading so that we can, and we, to do that, we have to perceive the website. What do we have to do to perceive the website? He goes, we need a dedicated server. I said, okay. so." Fortunately, I had a friend of mine who had a dedicated server and he wasn't using hardly any of it. So I, we slipped everything over on my buddy's dedicated server. Now we could see exactly where the website was hanging up. We got the prediction in on how to handle it, the planning, the production took place. Now, like I said, so as you're moving forward, I'm gonna give you another personal example of this. I'm sure you've all driven down the highway with your cruise control on in your car. And you're going down the right lane and you're coming up on a car or a truck in front of you and you're perceiving how rapidly are you coming up on it. And based on that perception of how rapidly you're coming up on it, you're predicting when do I need to move lanes and go around the car. And then you see a car coming up on your left behind you that's going a little faster than you and you're perceiving that car and you're predicting how long is that car going to take to get by me. And based on that perception, of the car and the prediction of how car, fast the car is moving, you know you have to, have to get, if you have to hit the brake or turn the cruise control off and slow the car down, or is the car gonna pass and then you execute a plan of getting around and get the pro product of getting around the car or the truck that was in front of you. You've all experienced that. And you went through perception, 
prediction, planning, production. You do this all the time. You look at how much, you perceive how much gas is in your car and you go, okay, can I predict that I can get home in time with that? I got a plan, I'll get gas over here. And then you stop and get gas and you get your, the product. We do this all the time. So really what we have to have is the perception in that we can then predict, we can then plan, we can then get our production going. Okay. Oh, one more important point. I almost forgot about this one. I'm talking about goals. One of the, the, one of the tools I use with my teams is an attainable goal. Now, let's just say that you have, we have a goal to do $100,000 a month in sales, and we're not doing any right now, okay? Well, to attain 100000 it might take a long time, and we never get to win. I have a friend of mine in the NSA uh, called Mark Eaton, and Mark, Mark is a, was an NBA player, and I think he was playing for the Utah Jazz back in the 80s, and the Utah Jazz was losing games by like 12 points. And he said, the way the coach turned the team around, he goes, great, let's lose a game by eight points. It was an attainable goal. He goes, he didn't go, let's go win a game. We're going to win a game. He goes, no, let's lose a game by eight points. And then they said they started losing games by eight points. They lost two or three games at eight points. He goes, good, let's lose a game by six points. So they lost one by six points. He said, let's lose it by four points. And after that, the guy said, this is stupid. They had their confidence up. They had their goal. The, the, the team was coming together. They said, we're, gonna, we're not going to lose it game by four points we're going to win the game but the way he got them to win the game was by getting them to lose a game by eight points it was an attainable goal now as an example when i went to norway we didn't just get in the boat and go to norway okay we had attainable goals and i, I showed you the, the route the first route here we go come on the first route was to go to bermuda that was about a seven day sail. So what did we do? We went to Bermuda. That was our first attainable goal. We hit Bermuda and then we validated the fact we hit Bermuda. We celebrated. We went around and ran around Bermuda and drank beer and saw Bermuda and had a great time. We worked on the boat, got it all cleaned up again. And then the next leg was to get to the Azores. And we get to the Azores and what do we do? It was an attainable goal. We validate the fact we got to the Azores. We, we talk about what happened. We review everything. That's great. We work on the boat. We go tour and hike all over the Azores. The next one is Southern Ireland. The same thing happened. Attainable goal. We validate. We got Southern Ireland. Great. This is fantastic. Then we went up again through Scotland across, and then we finally hit our final goal. But we did it by attainable goals. And so if you start at the end of the year or beginning of the year and you say, our goal is to be at 100000 a month, and you never take a win. Remember, we're talking about the emotional component of your group. You never let your group win until you hit 100,000. It's going to bring the emotions down. So let's give them a win every time we can and, and, and validate what they're doing so that it's right. Now, I'm going to take the same graph and let's just look at it as a business. Or as, a, as a business, We start a business. We say, let's see what we can do in a month. And we do about 18,000 in sales. We say, good, let's keep that up. We keep driving it. We get it up to about 25,000 in sales. We said, okay, this is working good. Let's try to hit... Let's, let's have up sales every single month. And we just start driving forward and we have up sales every single month until the end of the year, we're up at the $100,000 mark where we wanted. But all along the way, we're taking wins, we're validating it, we're giving each other high fives because we had an attainable goal. I have turned so many organizations around by attainable goals. Just as an example, I, I had one group I went into and we needed to start having morning staff meetings and start getting everybody on the same page. And everybody was coming to work late. So the first attainable goal, I didn't even have a staff meeting. And what I said was, I'd like everybody, everybody to be here at eight o'clock. You know, it was Friday, Monday morning, come in at eight o'clock, we're gonna have coffee and bagels. So what did I do? I gave them a little incentive and we had an attainable goal to be here at eight o'clock. We had their coffee and bagels and we had a good, leadership takes communication and agreement. I talked to them as we ate their coffee and bagels. That was something that didn't typically happen. And I said, would you guys agree to be here at eight o'clock every morning? Is that something we can agree to do? And we talked about it with what was going on. And we went around with everybody in the room and they all agreed to show up at eight o'clock. I said, great, this, this whole week, and we'll continue it on, a, uh, you know, we'll continue bringing in coffees and coffee and bagels, but I want you to be here at eight o'clock. And so everybody's like, great, let's be here at eight o'clock. The next week we started staff meetings, but I gave them the first attainable goal, just show up to work on time. <laughs> We got them to work on that, okay? Just to wrap this up, leadership is everybody's business, okay? Abundant communication, create agreement with them. Use that attainable goals so that they're winning all the time. Validate what people do right. 
Don't harp on what they do wrong. Reward them for doing things right. Ignite their free will so that they are people you don't have to control. So you can build a team that you don't have to control that, that uh, will do it themselves. So those are some of the leadership skills that I've, I've developed. I can do deep dives on a lot of these things and there are a lot of components I use. I wasn't able to squeeze in this hour. We have a couple of minutes, Irish. I don't know if anybody has a comment or a question, uh, but I hope you found this useful. I hope, I hope your time was valuable today. So, Man, let's give him a big round of applause. Please, please, Lance Miller, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. Guys, if there's a, a, a question, please go ahead and speak up if you've got a, a maybe follow up. Uh, yes, Armin. Armin, yeah. Uh, thank you, Lance, uh, first of all, for, uh, for your content. It was pretty awesome. Um, I had an opportunity to kind of look at your uh, website and some of the work that you've done. So pretty exciting stuff. So I, I do a little bit of um, speaking. Uh, it, it comes with the job. And, um, you know, one of the things you've mentioned is that you've competed many years, right? Consecutively before you won. So my question for you is, you know, what type of adjustments did you make from year to year? I mean, what did you do different? Did it progress? Was it what happened? It was, it was all it was all over the board. First of all, and that's a whole other talk, okay? And that's that's not a question that's e easily answered in a minute or two. But the simplicity was I had to speak with my messages and what I call from my center. If that makes sense to you, you're really speaking from where you live as a as a being. And I'm not talking about a body, but I'm talking where we emotionally live, our life energy, whatever we however we want to phrase that, and. What had happened with me was I talked about this whole evolution between free will and authority. It happened to me less than it happened to a lot of other people, but my whole life, I was always being told what I should say, how I should say it. I was being reprimanded by parents or teachers or, you know, bosses that I was, I was speaking out when I shouldn't and things. And so there was a lot of confusion I had to get through. And I did that by being in Toastmasters and just speaking and competing all the time because nobody fires you in Toastmasters. Okay. And as I always say, if, if, if I was going to promote the organization, I would promote it as a great place to fail because you make all your mistakes there and then you don't make them out there. But it was really sort of digging down to really where did I live and where could I speak from? So my intention, my focus, my interest was truly coming from me. And I wasn't trying to be somebody on stage. I wasn't. The other thing is, is that I consider speaking to be like a muscle and just like if you want to be a great athlete, you have to exercise and you have to train. And that's what the Toastmasters organization gave me was a place to exercise and train so that when I did get into environments, my speaking muscle is strong. And there's a lot of components to speaking muscles. And I, but I had to learn how to tell stories correctly. I had to learn how to, how to have good ba uh, facial gestures. I had to learn how to tell stories, not narrate stories. There are, there's a, a hundred things that went on with that. And if you, Armin, if you wanted to talk to me about that later, you're welcome to contact me. Sounds good. So it sounds like authenticity and a lot of practice. Yeah. And just a lot of, a lot of face time, a lot of stage time, you know, in front of audiences and you, you don't become a great speaker by not speaking. Thank you. Anybody else? Guys, what a wonderful hour. Lance, you've dropped so many nuggets for the entire organization. We're going to be talking about this talk for months to come, bringing up these topics and trying to explore them further. I would I, I actually welcome that that opportunity to bring in you back and maybe discussing just how to you know the speaking muscles and how to how to deliver a message and so sure. thank you Lance we truly appreciate it guys the action item for uh, the CRM for Genius Makers is you know what you took away from Lance's uh, discussion today and why that was so important to you and how you want to apply that I'll go ahead and post that as well for everybody so that you know what to do but let's give another huge round of applause for Mr. Miller.